Hello, good morning, everyone. It's an unusual time for us to be presenting Mom at Home, 11 a.m. Pacific time. Uh, had to wake up a little earlier today to make sure we kick this off right on time. Uh, in fact, I think I was up pretty much all night long just thinking about today's episode. Uh, it's a special one. We've got blues and soul singer-songwriter, Grammy Award nominated. Uh, I've been I've been bragging that he was uh, spent some time here in Temecula, my, my stomping grounds right now, but Mr. Sugar Ray Rayford is with us today. Uh, also, I, I, I'm i learning so much about him, but uh, former Marine, uh, which I hold a sp- near and dear place in all of our hearts, so I want to thank him for his service there, but uh, just an exceptional career an exceptional person and uh, our very own Mr. Bill and uh, Sugar Ray have shared some time together which is why we're able to bring him here Uh, he's just an amazing person so I'm going to turn it over to these two wonderful gentlemen let's kick off the conversation and I want to hear all about his career his experiences and what is coming up in the future ready guys how are you doing today Hey, 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 hey. Welcome to Mom and Home. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hey, let me say before we even get started, because I won't get a chance to say this again, I want to say Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there. We love you. Oh, My yeah. God, this this world would be horrible if it was only us <laughs> lone legged guys out there. I'm just <laughs> yeah. I mean, you see what happens when we're in charge. It's just foo bar. So, ladies, all you mothers out there, thank you. And but- we love you. And I hear having kids is genetic. If 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 your parents didn't have any children, chances are you won't either. Well, you know, my, it could be. That's true. That's true. But I would also say that if there wasn't no women, you know, dinosaurs would still be here. So you know, <laughs> there'd be no men. My God, the first generation would just die off. Uh, you know how we are. Oh, I got a fever. I can't move. I can't, you know, women. Uh, anyway. Yeah. Somebody bring me some chicken soup, please. please I can't please. get out of bed. Please. Oh, man. I know I know where this, this conversation is going, so I'm going to let you guys tear it up. All right, gentlemen. Oh, man. Sugar Ray. <laughs> what a great way to start the morning. Uh, how you doing, Bill? I'm doing great, and it's so great to see you. And even more rewarding for me is to see how well you are doing uh, as a solo artist. It's just you know, the years I was playing with you and Aunt Kizzy's boys, I would watch you on stage. I'd be sitting on my keyboard trying to not get in the way, and I'd watch, and I'd listen. Man, this dude hits the stage like like a thundercloud and doesn't let the audience go for three hours straight. And I knew you were <laughs> destined for greatness, so thanks for being here with us. I, I apologize for that, Bill. You know, I get a little zealous, man. I get on the stage and, yeah, it, it, it like, what, 45, 15, 40, screw that. Let's just play straight through. <laughs> You don't have to apologize. If you did it to me now, it'd probably kill me. But (laughs) all those years ago, I was able to hang. (laughs) Uh, We we had a lot of fun, Bill. I mean, and Kissy's Boys, that was a lot of fun. It was crazy. And that was was my first foyer uh, being serious into the blues. I mean, and... uh, It was a great band, great, great, great list of characters. Let me let me just give them shouts. And I know you got a program, but let me give a shout out to Jimmy King, Dwayne Hathorn, Big Joe Scalvone, Bill Kilpatrick, Bostos Moeno, and uh, all the satellites, Leo Dumbecki, Michael Mack, uh, and so many guys that came in and sat in and played with us through the years. So it was a lot of fun. Amen. And and one final shout out to you, Sugar Ray, because uh, you really drove the bus. This this is true. One of the nights, maybe there were a couple nights, we had a gig and we knew you were you were going to be running late. You know, you couldn't make the first set. You were somewhere else doing something. So we start out the night and it was always a great band. The night would start. We'd be rocking. We'd be kick, you know, just killing it. But the minute you hit the stage, it elevated that show from, man, what a great band. Oh, my God, I'm going to stop what I'm doing and really pay 100% attention to these. Oh, (laughs) come on, Bill. Come on. Stop it. Stop (laughs) it. Stop it some more. (laughs) Thank you, Bill. I I appreciate that. You know, I always just had fun, man. I've always been, I've always thought that if I'm having fun, then the audience is going to have fun. And that's, that's, that's the energy I try to bring. Amen to that. I, I've had a, an expression for years. If it ain't fun, it's time to be done. And, it's, oh, yeah. wow. I like that. I, I may yeah, have to steal yeah. that, Bill. You're welcome to steal it. I don't have it patented or copyrighted or anything. That, that, you should. God, that, yeah. is, that is deep, dude. That, yeah. If it ain't fun, it's time to be done. I agree right. with that. Yeah. yeah. Totally and, agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. And music should always be fun. And, you know, you make it so fun. Um, so, all right. I'm going to get to my script here. <laughs> 
right. All right. But we can run all over the map, Ray. Seriously, you, the script you, is you, just. You, you, you know me. <laughs> <laughs> I do know you. And that's why I wanted to have you here. Uh, and I think, I hope, uh, I think uh, D is watching today. I had uh, sent him uh, the note on Facebook. Uh, I don't have Facebook, uh, I don't think, with any of the others, but uh, hopefully he's here today. Dwayne, if you're here, thanks for joining us. Hey, Bone, what uh, up, baby? <laughs> Hi, Patty. Hope everything good. <laughs> I think Dwayne's still in Fallbrook, right? Yep. Yeah, they've got this great yeah. place in Fallbrook. We've been there a couple times. I was there for one of his birthdays. Uh, fun, fun time. Right. And um, uh, Dwayne, I mean... Known as the pocket. I mean, he's yeah, yeah. he's still he's still playing hard. I know he plays with Bill McGee here and there. Oh, is it, is Bill still playing? Yeah, yeah, Bill's still oh, playing. That's um, good. That's good. And Dwayne also plays with this young fellow named Anthony Collins. He's, yeah, uh, young uh, yeah. the Fallbrook kid, I think Fallbrook they call kid. him. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Nice, yeah. Good, good guitars. Yeah. Nice. He's gonna be good. Future of the blues right there, baby. That's it. Yeah. So they're they're doing great. And I've already sort of put the hint, hey, you know, if your bass player ever needs a sub, let me know. Obviously, the guitar player's not gonna sub out. <laughs> I know that feeling, yeah. <laughs> so let's kind of go back a little bit. All right. One of the one of the reviews I read about you once, the reviewer said Sugar Ray is a gospel shouter, a true gospel shouter, which is a term that I wasn't familiar with. So yeah. could you give us a little definition when they say you're a gospel shouter? What does that well, mean? Well, you got to think about it. Like I grew up gospel and uh, I was really deep in the gospel and I had, you know, a lot of people don't know that I had raised, gotten raised pretty high in the in the gospel scene. This is before mm -hmm. the days. Of, I was Kirk Franklin before there was a Kirk Franklin. I had to, you know, almost like James Brown when I was directing a choir and all that. And uh, but I say that to say that, you know, uh, a lot of churches you went to, especially back then, they didn't have big PA systems and all this. So uh, it was almost like opera. You had to have a voice that projected. And, you know, think about it, like one of my choirs, IYC, uh, which stood for Interdenominational Youth Choir, I had 315 choir members. So imagine wow. if you were lead singer or you're directing the choir or whatever, and your voice has to be heard over all those voices behind you mm -hmm. uh, to the audience out in front of you. Uh, sometimes without a microphone. So it's called gospel shouting. And, uh, you know, Aretha Franklin is a good uh, example of that. Uh, and when, once you amplify, you know, people just like, man, listen to the power. But that power comes from years of singing without microphones and still be able to, uh, to, to project all those nuances and all uh, that emotion and uh, emoting uh, without a microphone to an audience with a giant, uh, you know, with, with three times the number of voices behind you. And so that's kind of like, what uh, gospel shouter come from but you know it goes deeper than that that type of singing really comes from the days of slavery and mm -hmm. when they, when the when the slaves used to work out in the field they would sing songs you know to to, to help uh you know with with timing and 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 help with the labor and you would have one person uh who would be leading the song so mm -hmm. You know, you hear one person in the field, you know, you, you can be spread out over four acres uh, picking whatever. And somebody may, I heard the Lord and he heard my cry. But they had to go out so that everybody heard it. Then everybody else would ah, join in on that. So that's where the whole sh uh, uh, shouting and key uh, type thing came from. And, okay. that, and then, then that went into gospel shouting because it all is all broiled together. And, mm -hmm. and that's where that uh, uh, quick definition of what gospel shouters are. That's a great you definition. Know. Yeah. And obviously so much of the music that we grew up with, we listen to still now, can trace its roots really all the way back oh. to that period of time. When you start talking about the, the greats of, of, uh, of the of decades past, you know, we start talking about the Otis Reddings, uh, the Aretha Franklins, the Tyrone Davises, mm -hmm. the, the Bobby Blands, the the ZZ, all these guys, uh, uh, even even Muddy and Wolf and all these guys, you know, they all started at church. Yeah. It all started at church. I mean, all yeah. of us back then, it was like that's where the singers come from, not singers. You know, because <laughs> we used to say in church, that's different. You know, you'd be like, oh, oh, she sang, she she sings really well, and that means that you were pretty. But you know, we always <laughs> said in church, you can't be pretty and sing. You got to get ugly. And so when you got ugly and you hit them real hard notes and people got chills, we say, now you singing. That girl can that girl can sing. Or oh, that go. band can sing. It's A N G, and that's a whole <laughs> different term. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Now, so staying with the gospel shouting thing, then is it something that you practice, or or do these fellows just and yourself? It just comes out naturally. Uh, you know what? I don't mm -hmm. ever remember uh, practicing it. I just mm -hmm. remember being thrown in the choir, 
uh, uh, Mr. Reverend Ricky Warren, one of the, the greatest B3 players I've met in my life. You know, all those all those guys that I grew up with, Alvin Mason, Ricky Warren, Tony Williams, uh, the list goes on and on. You know, I didn't realize uh, how blessed it was. You know, all those guys played four 10-finger chords, and the bass line was paid on the foot pedals. And they would do that and sing, and, and sometimes direct the choir. Uh, but they threw me in the middle. You know, I was a young break dancer, all that. I remember them throwing me in the middle, so – you had to learn to hold your pitch. So they stood me in the middle between the strongest alto and the strongest tenor. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, I remember him used to yell at me and, and like, he like, pick a, pick a, uh, pick one tenor or alto. You can't be going back and forth. You pick one. And, uh, and I used to be like, how the hell is he hearing my voice with all these people been singing? Uh, but Ricky can pick you out. And so you learn and you learn to sing from your diaphragm. See, most singers today, uh, I'll come out and say that, uh, especially in popular music, they're throat they're throat singers. They mm-hmm. they don't they, you know you, you don't hear that great yeah well you know uh, uh, other than people like Fantasia and a few who actually sing from the diaphragm. Mm-hmm. Most singers are, are trying to be pretty and this or guys trying to be way up you know second alto first alto where women sing mm-hmm. uh, naturally. Uh, so you don't have that. But in my day, you know, you listen to the Teddy Pendergrasses, the Harold Melvins, the you know uh, the the OJs. Uh, uh, Ed Levert, those guys, you know, it was a, from the diaphragm. So you get used to singing that way, which is the proper way to sing. You ever go to school and they teach you to sing, the first thing they teach you is how to breathe and sing from your diaphragm. And mm-hmm. that's how you learn to project. And, you know, I, I go back to opera singers, or one, opera singers and a few uh, blues shouters anymore are the only ones who actually do that. Because, you know, think about opera. You know, you had to learn to do that from your diaphragm. Even if you was going with a head voice, mm-hmm. you still had to project over the orchestra, the the backdrop, out into over this audience, and they had to be able to hear you, especially if you was a lead. Well, you can yeah. sing falsetto all day, but if you if you don't know how to sing for your diaphragm, then you can't get in the volume. Yeah, you're not going to project. You're not going to be heard. Right. Uh, thanks for the lesson. Is that that is something that needs to maybe be sort of brought back? Uh, a I lot think of so. People, yeah, yeah. A lot of people are used to, like you say, this very sort of airy head voice uh, sound where it. All the strength and the power does come from the diaphragm, the the tone, right. the projection, everything. So, I'll just give you a big amen on that one there, uh, Ray. You, <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, if I remember right, now I've got about fifteen years on you, my friend. But uh, you and I, I think we're brought up in the same way. A lot of tough love. Uh, you're oh, yeah. you're brought up in 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 Tyler, Texas. Am I remembering that correctly? Yeah, yeah. Tyler, Tyler, Tyler in Dallas, but Tyler's home. Okay, so. Give me a, an idea how much of, of that upbringing that you had you, you think directly impacts your passion oh. for the excellence of what you do. Oh, man, all, all of it. You know, my grandma always said, uh, you don't try, you do. And, uh, oh, you, you know, uh, she just made us, you know, uh, when you commit to something, your word is bond. Uh, I'm still that way. Uh, if I if I shake hands with you and say I'm going to do something, you know, it, it's got to be some biblical for a reason that it didn't happen. I'm going to make it happen no matter what, because if I give you my word, uh, that's all I really have in this world. When everything else is gone, the money, the houses, the blah, 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 all you have left as a, as a man in a way is your word. And so I was brought up that way and I approach everything that way. Then, you know, you know, spend all those years in the Marine Corps, uh, eight to 10 years in the Corps. And it, it that also reinforced that because the, the, the Corps was the same way. I remember when I came in the Marine Corps, the motto used to be, we do more before 5 a.m. than most people do all day. And, uh, uh, you know, but I was from the country and I was used to doing more before 5 a.m. than most people <laughs> did all day. So it, it just re- double reinforced that. And uh, that is part of me. It's not like a, 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 it's not like a shirt that I put on. It is my skin. Yeah. And so I approach everything in that manner. Yeah. Yeah. So thanks to grandma for that real strong, oh, solid definitely. upbringing. Yeah. 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 You had a bitch across the head. You, <laughs> you're going to be smart or stupid, but you're going to be one or the other. <laughs> <laughs> I think I remember a few tales about grandma when we were hanging up backstage. Oh, yeah. Big, big mama. God bless her soul. I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for her, but God yeah. bless her soul. God bless her soul. Now, I think uh, I remember a couple of times we'd be on a gig, maybe on a break, and I'd see you sit down at on uh, on Dwayne's drum kit to start yeah. rocking out a groove. So did you play drums growing up, too, I, and maybe some other the, instruments? From the, from the age of five uh, up until I quit playing music, I left the church uh, 17, 18, 
and didn't play music again, really, pretty much until I met you guys. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so, uh, but yeah, I was a drummer, uh, drummer and choir director. And it was funny, I, I had only led like one or two songs. I was always a choir director yeah. or or the drummer. So I loved playing the drums, you know, and uh, yeah. it, it was it was my passion. Uh, it's yeah. kind of weird because like when I quit playing music, um, I, I really didn't miss anything. And it wasn't when I got back into music, uh, it was strange because all of a sudden I was thrown out front to be the front guy uh instead of being the drummer and uh, and you know so i don't play as much and you know i play a little keyboards i play enough when i'm writing you know enough to get by i would never play in front of you or some of the keyboard players i know but you know i i i pick around a little bit just uh, especially when i'm writing you know if i have an idea you know i'm able to at least pick the chords out right and uh give it to someone who can take it and actually turn it into something so mm -hmm. yeah but I was a drummer. Yeah. I always been a drummer. And if it wasn't a blue moon, I'll go to a jam, a city, and somewhere, and sit on drums and play and sing. And people always looking at you like, "What you play the drum?" Because they just not used to seeing me doing it. So <laughs> that was my reaction too. And you know, it's funny, right? Let, let me get this in BJ, and then I'm gonna let, let you take it. Uh, you share that in common with Karen Carpenter. Karen Carpenter oh. was a fine drummer, uh, and in fact, wanted to sit behind the kit and sing. She did not want to be pulled out front, but that obviously finally happened. So. Well, it's kind of girl. weird. It's kind of weird. Like today, when I look at uh, Anderson Pack, and I'm like, we, you know, the young kids. This is new to them because they grew up almost with nothing but hip hop yeah. uh, and pop. So for them, they they look at Anderson Pack, and he is a phenomenal uh, musician and 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 songwriter. But yeah. you know, some of the thing is that they're freaked out that he's playing the drums and singing like that. And I'm just like, well, <laughs> yeah, that's what it's what we all did. That's that's what real music was like. You know, it's like right. <laughs> it's kind of. You know, I was listening to that new song with them and Bruno Mars, and I was just like, it's a great song that uh, leave the door open. And I was like, dude, all they did was go back to the 60s. You know, it's got a little shy lights. It's got a little earth, wind, and fire into it. It's just real music. <laughs> what, what, what what we've done on our daily gigs forever. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. and so instead of them using electronics, they're actually bringing musicians back. And I, <laughs> I'm very happy to see that. Uh, as are we all and the musicians. BJ, what were you going to well, jump in Well, I was just going to comment on being being the singing drummer, man. You have actually been, that's, you know, it's terrifying as a drummer. I mean, I've, I've been, I'm a drummer too, and I only sing like harmonies, and it's terrifying. I'm like, I can't imagine just like going in fr from my comfort zone, you know, just jamming out, having to lead mm. the band then. I'm like, I, I can't fathom that, but You've you've graduated, man. You got the promotion that none of us get, and it's like <laughs> no, no. You, it, you know, you know, it's the it's the exact same thing. You see, drummers always think that way, and I always tell them, remember, you're the drummer. So all those accents and everything you hit, you're already leading the band. You're leading the band with the drums. The only difference is now you're singing. You're still leading the band with your drums. You, yeah. you see what I'm saying? No, I get. It. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So absolutely. It, it's not that you're changing anything. The only difference is instead of. Uh, uh, the camera always getting the guitar player, the keyboard player, or the singer. You know, the camera's on you now, uh, all, mostly. And and but you're still leading the band through the drums. Yeah. I mean, I, every band I've ever had, it, it, it's it's drum drum, it's drum rhythm section uh, oriented first because if your rhythm section isn't tight, you know, I always say I want my I always tell my rhythm guys you got to be as tight as a net. I can't say the word net tiny <laughs> over over a fifty five gallon drum because everything else is just uh, condiments. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know the real yeah. meat is the rhythm section. If the rhythm section is not tight and together, yeah. uh, then then the band is gonna fall apart. And right. you know you got to think about Ramsey Lewis, drummer. <clears throat> mm -hmm. You know uh, 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 Maurice White, drummer. Hmm. Uh, I, I mean we can go on and on. Uh, yeah. Marvin Gaye, drummer. Uh, yeah. A lot of people don't know that Marvin Gaye, all that stuff yeah. with the, the Dells, all that Diana Ross stuff, a bunch of stuff from Motown before he was actually uh, allowed to sing. He's the drummer on that stuff. No, okay, good. Yeah. I didn't... Did you did you find that having that experience as a drummer when you when you took over the band as a singer, did that help you direct the rest of the band? Did you did you tap into that or was it was uh... it your own? No, it was more of all them years of directing choirs. And so, okay. you know, uh, unlike a lot of people, uh, I, I I was always pushed out front. Hmm. Uh, the difference when I came over to circular music was instead of my back being to the church, you know, I was just turned around the other way. Yeah, okay. Yeah. But I was always the guy, one of those guys that was pushed out front, whether I wanted to be or not. Hmm. And, and my personality, you know, I'm, I could, you know, I, I, I'm – Big, joyous, a uh, lot of energy, and uh, 
I don't know. It just, you know, well, I, I will tell you this. The one thing that I took from church that I use in every show that I have is that I was always taught to sing and play from the back of the church to the front. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times if I'm doing festivals and stuff, you'll notice that I'm, doing it, I'm not even looking at the people in the first three rows. <laughs> Yeah. I'm looking at the people up in the bleachers because I already got the people in the first three to five rows. You can hear and see everything. Mm -hmm. It's those people in the back. If I can keep their attention and keep them off their phone or talking to each other or trying to run to go to get a drink, then you've done your job. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. Right yeah. on. Hmm. Now, now you, you told BJ and I a pretty cool story yesterday about how you got back into music. You were, you'd been through the Marines. Thank you for that. Uh, you were bouncing down here in Carlsbad at hey. a place called Boris Crossing. Boris but Crossing. then there, there's a little joint across the street that sort of pulled you in and, and lit the fire again. Could you the, share that story with everybody? The alley, you know, Wednesday nights was slow nights uh, at Boars was the slow night. And uh, so Wednesday night would be one bartender, one one bouncer, me, the cooler. I would work that day because I'm not paying anybody to work on Wednesday night because it was slow. It was also the night that uh, that uh, the club would uh, try out new acts. And so it was it would be slow. And across a diagonal across the street from us was the Coyote Bar. But a diagonal from us right across the railroad tracks, if you know downtown Carlsbad, right there on Grand, uh, <laughs> was this little bitty place called The Alley. And every Wednesday night, there was this great blues band played in there called Runny Lane and the Texas Twisters. And I used to run over there, man, and look in the And that place would be jumping on Wednesday. It'd just be <laughs> jumping, packed. And I would be looking in the window. And, you know, the, and what made me, what drew me over there was not the people, was the music sounded like gospel. And I was like, what are they doing? I go over there and I see this guy running Lane, sitting down, playing his guitar and great band. And they rolling and rocking. And, and so uh, I would go in and sit in, didn't know any blues songs. And just, you know, but Running Lane was a sweetheart. He let me come in there and just destroy his set and tear it up. And, <laughs> and uh, it was horrible, but he would always encourage me. He's like, man, you got, you know, you learned some of these songs, you know, you got this. And uh, the bass player of that band, who, band uh, Tim Cash, who also was the bass player for the Bayou Brothers, or he was the bass player for the Bayou Brothers. <laughs> Tim Cash once gave me a paperback book that had like 10,000 songs in it. Hmm. had all the words and the music, blues songs. And man, I went home and devoured that thing. And uh, Pam and I, at this time, Pam and I, uh, we were friends. I don't even think we were dating yet. We were just friends. And uh, she would go and buy uh, t a tape. This was for CD. She'd go buy a tape. <laughs> and then we would go over. I, I wound up getting Wednesday nights off. We would go over and sit in the parking lot. And I would learn the song in the car and then run in and sing the song with the band. And and that, and that, was, my, that was my start in, in the blues, man. That was my start. <laughs> What a commitment. What a passion. That is incredible. Oh, I loved it. It, it. it was really, really cool. And then from there, you know, I started the Urban Gypsies. And we kind of started a big uh, a soul funk band, big eight-piece soul funk band, which at the time wound up being like the, one of the top uh, bands in San Diego. I remember it used to be us, the Urban Gypsies. Uh, it was uh, the B-Side Players, uh, Detroit Underground, and uh, uh, Mackay. Uh, and Art Deco, those were the big bands at the time. Mm. Uh, you know, we were playing the Belly Ups and the Mr. A's and all mm -hmm. that stuff back in the day. So, yeah, wow. that was cool. Oh, yeah, fun stuff. I mean, I'm going to have BJ uh, screen a little picture yeah. here, which... Your stories of Ronnie Lane take me back because I, we, I shared this with you yesterday. I, I used to live right above him in Carlsbad when I was like 20 years ago when I was just a kid, just fresh into California and learning what was going on out here, man. He was the nicest, nicest guy, you know. So, yeah, he was. That's, that's, did, did, did you ever get him to tell you some stories? Because he has some stories, man. I I, th I was too I was too shy. I was too shy at the time. So I mean, we, we would just kind of like in passing, like, hey. And then I I didn't know who he was, and right. until like I made like the Carlsbad crawl and ended up seeing him play at one of the clubs there, and I'm like, oh my gosh. And then uh, yeah, it was like, well, you're an amazing guitar he's like thank you very much <laughs> that's funny yep. you say that the cars bad crawl that's what we used to call it bad crawl yep. <laughs> yeah they, yeah. they still they still call it that to this day Do they? Yeah. you know I'm, people start people would start the g spot go to hennessy's then come up to the alley then over the coyote ball or actually over the boards for a while because you know coyote ball was kind of sophisticated yeah right sophisticated you know <laughs> <laughs> sophisticated beer. but they started having a blues night too i think it was like a, on a tuesday or wednesday night or something okay. like that yeah, yeah for a while yeah yeah, yeah. 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 See, i go back to cars bad when they still had the big chicken up front <laughs> oh. you remember that bill you that know big I, chicken? right at the twin um uh, was it tw twin 
Twin yeah, Hills, right? That, yeah, that, that place has been so many names, but yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, oh <laughs> you bet. <laughs> Too much fun, uh, and there must be uh, an actual map because that sounds like the same Carlsbad crawl that I hear people. Yeah, we're going to start out at uh, we're going to start out G spot and then move to Boar's Head and get over to the alley and. <laughs> Carlsbad, we're we're not being sponsored by Carlsbad in any way, and I'm much right. I'm too old to do the crawl anymore. My, my, <laughs> days man, of days I, of your days well, of your. I, I, I you know how many people you know how many people I saved, and I mean, and it happened quite a few times. It's turned so somber now, but uh, yeah. you know how many people I saved from being hit by the train. You know, oh, yeah, I, no I, I don't know I don't know how old your producer is. Mm-hmm. But there used to be no speed limit for the trains right there. Mm. So the, the yeah. trains used to come across there like at 70 miles an hour. Yeah. And uh, it, it took about eight to 12 people being killed that they finally mm. said, uh, I think they slowed down starting in Solana Beach, and they're they only allowed to do like 30 miles an hour when they come through Carlsbad. Yeah, they so slowed them. They, they, yeah, they, sl- they slowed them down, but it's yeah. still there's still some there's still some tragedies on there. I mean, I, I had a gig one time at Coyote. Uh-huh. And and something happened, and it yeah. was it was yeah. you know it's terrible when that happens. Well, it's it's weird where it's placed because that track is in between three really rocking clubs, and people yeah, are right. and yeah. they're less than a hundred yards a piece in mm. either direction, and people are just going back and forth, and they've been drinking like crazy, and yeah. but like you think about how bad it is now, but you think about it when those trains were doing seventy seventy five. Wow. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And who knows? Who knows what they're dealing with? If if you know, I I guess it's uh, time for PSA. If, you know, we don't. If you if you need help, get help because you yeah. know it's none of that is worth it. You know, and people nope. love you. Right. So right. you know, yeah. that's yeah. that's my PSA for today. <laughs> right on. <laughs> didn't mean didn't mean to go somber, but that no just worries. Hey, in my head when I thought thinking about it all of it's, that. It's, no it's part of the story, man. Thank God you were there for the ones who uh, who needed you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, several times. I could not yeah. believe it. Like, yeah. Mm. 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 Well, let's take a look at this picture here, Ray. Uh, I describe this as here you are telling it. (laughs) You're telling a story right there. And, you know, we talked earlier about the difference between a singer and a sanger. Yeah. I think this fits the latter definition. How often do do people come up to you on a gig after the gig and say, man, you were singing my story? Dude, it's happened uh, a a lot of times. And, uh, you know, there's some that stick out. You know, I remember once uh, we were playing down in, is it Escondido? No, it was down in Santee mm-hmm. in that little, that little amphitheater they have down there. They used to have a, 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 you never, I don't think you played that one, Bill. I think by then you were going out of the band. But, uh, and Kisses, but we used to play down there. And uh, uh, one night, one day we were playing there. It's hot, you know, mm-hmm. this is Santee. And yeah, this sure. thing is is concrete and surrounded by rock mm-hmm. and no shade, but we throwing wow. down as always. <laughs> and uh, after the show, a guy walked up to me. Uh, I was standing there. Jimmy was standing there, and he walked up to me. He said, "Man, your 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 music really moved me." And uh, right I think we were doing. Uh, I think we were doing one of our slow ones, either "Worry, Worry" or uh, yeah. something like that. And he said, he told us, he like, my house is right there. He could point to his apartment across the way. He like, uh, he literally had the gun in his mouth. Yeah, in in, wow. his bath, in his bathroom, and wow. he had the, the window open, and he, he heard the music. Uh, he put the gun down and mm-hmm. uh, sat there and listened to the entire show. And then then uh, he was compelled to come down and talk to us. And we talked to him for about a couple of hours afterwards, oh, and, and I made sure that he got got some help. But uh, yeah. I, I've had that type of situation a few times. So, mm-hmm. and which is why you know it's really hard. Like now with under contract, you know. Uh, Record companies have all these writers and stuff for me, uh, but I always tell them that you know I'm from the old school, and what I mean by that is I'm from the church, and they're like, well, what is what's that got to do with anything? And I tell mm-hmm. them that, like, well, I was always taught you could sing a lie, just as easy as you could tell a lie, mm-hmm. and and the songs that I sing, every song I sing, uh, has to have something in it that's real for me, for me to go out and sing it because I'm not one of those. Uh, or pretty singers, I, you know. I, it's all about the story to me, yeah. and uh, I, you know, it, it's got to have real meaning. So I don't do anything that I don't feel that you know. I, it just didn't happen to me. I've never had this happen. I don't know. No, I'm not going to sing that because uh, when you're singing, uh, not to get too philosophical, but you're singing the spirit. You're talking to people's heart and soul, and yeah. people don't even realize that at a show. Uh, they they've all become spiritual, whether they realize it or not. This mm-hmm. is why people can come up to you. The band could be smiling and giggling, and somebody could walk up to them like, "What's going on with the bass player and the drummer?" You know, they they they, they don't realize it, but when you look, talk about music, you know that, that sixth sense is opened up, and mm-hmm. and so this is why 
whatever is happening on the stage will pour into the audience one way or the other. So yeah. this is why I always try to bring joy and happiness. Uh, even if I'm singing a sad song, it got it's got to have meaning. It got to be real. It can't just be a a song. It's a story. And uh, the blues world kind of have gotten away from that a little bit, and it's become really guitar centric or or instrument centric. But you know, this is a music that was based on the story. It's an oratory music, and so if you can't tell the story, if you don't have a story to tell, then you just make a lot of noise. That's my opinion. Hmm. Oh man, yeah. I I, I, got I, I took so much from that. I I mean. <laughs> The, the the when you said you can sing a lie just as easily as you could tell a lie that I'm like that was an epiphany for just at that moment I'm like oh my gosh you're so that's so correct you know you can't there's a there's authenticity that brings that enhances you know, I mean music is a connector it's it's something that binds us all together and when you bring your your true self to it or when you bring the authenticity of what you're producing in your music that just makes so much more sense that people will be you you're going to form strong form stronger connections that way yeah. Um, I'd never heard it. I'd never heard it expressed that way before. So, wow. Yeah. 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 And we, we talk about those connections all the time in the museum. Matter of fact, um, I've got a, another photo of you coming up and it, it epitomizes connecting with your story, with your song. Uh, and that story you just told about the gentleman, the Santee, I got major chills up and yeah, down my spine. That's amazing. Yeah. Telling that. That's tremendous. So let's talk about something all, all musicians go through. Uh, and that's those off nights. Starving. Right? <laughs> that too matter of fact i'm hungry can you guys take this i'm gonna go upstairs and eat half hour to lunch come on we got it <laughs> <laughs> yeah we all go through those nights where it's like oh man you know i wrecked my car today or i, I don't have enough money to pay the house i'm not feeling up to it how do you get through those and, and how do you make sure that none of that feeling that you have that you're going through is transmitted to your audience you, you want to actually use that feeling and transmit it to the audience hmm. Again, it goes back to being authentic. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, you can't go up there and fake. Uh, you, you know, if you're doing a single show and it's just your band, you can get away with a lot. If you're doing, if you're doing a concert and you're on the bill with a lot of other bands, you, you can very quickly, no matter how good the band uh, sounds, you can very quickly surmise what's real and what's just someone writing music. That make any sense? Yeah, absolutely. Mm. You know, when you're by yourself and you're controlling the space, it's just your band for two hours, you can get away with with, with murder. Uh, yeah. But, but you, you're on a bill and you got five or six bands, and most of the bands are tired or just phoning it in, and then you get that one band up there that is real. It's everyone, you know, you can, you can, it, it right away, you know right away as, as an audience. They know right away. And as a band, you know right away. Yeah. So I, mean, I, I, I use, I, I, you know, I, I'm very sincere. Even if I'm telling jokes or having fun, blah, 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 I am very sincere because uh, the, the biggest thing for me, Bill, has always been and, I'll, and shall it ever be uh, is that I respect the audience. And and it's not even about the money they spent. Uh, the bigger thing for me is that people took the time mm -hmm. to come out and see you. Right. You know, people talk about the ticket sales and that's cool and everywhere's good for the business and I got to deal with that. But the fact that someone drove 30 minutes, sometimes four hours to see you, I yeah. respect the fact that you did that. And whether I'm in pain, whether I'm whatever is going on, you're not going to really know that or I, you what you're going to get is the best show that I can give. Mm -hmm. hmm. yeah. and, and that's the way I approach it. Amen. I mean, it's a reciprocal respect for the fact that it is. A, they made that drive. B, right. they're spending their hard-earned money to come here. You perform. Yep. Uh, but they can spend their money on anything. The mm -hmm. fact that they, they took that. Uh, but like I say, people say money. For me, even more so, it's, it's the time. Mm -hmm. You know, you can get money back. Time, yeah. once you spent it, it's spent. Yeah. That is a big deal. Yeah. Amen. Um, and, I mean, I I can say this from working with you. You're you're always striving to do your best. Um after a performance, how often do you find yourself thinking, "Man, that was that was right on the money. That was my that was perfect." I ne I never do, Bill, because uh, I, you know I've never had that perfect show. I, I you know I've heard shows where people were just like, "Jesus Christ!" For me, I'm always striving to do better than I did last time. But most of the time, I don't because I'm one of those guys. I'm old school. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm pouring sweat. You know, I know you. you I mean, you know, you, you, I can literally wring my clothes out, and sometimes on stage, I actually wring my clothes out, and you can hear the collective. Audience go like, oh, you're like, a, you're like, wow. Uh, but I believe 
like BB did, uh, you know, I will sit and talk for hours after the show mm -hmm. with people. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to go hide in the green room. I'm going to come out and uh, mingle with the people. I'm going to talk to them. And uh, because, again, I, I respect the fact that they spent the time. So how dare any musician, any artist mm -hmm. that you can't take a few more minutes out of your schedule to sit down and talk to people who spent money, time and effort to come see you. Amen. Just ties right into what you were talking about a few minutes ago. Yeah, yeah. given that now, uh, now my band, you know, they're, they'll come drag me off because they're like, man, we got a twelve hour drive, or we got to fly to, <laughs> we got to flight in, in five hours. But you know, I, 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 because I'll just sit there. I, I, I've stayed out there two, three hours. I, sure. it doesn't matter to me. It's like, what am I going to do? Go to the room and sleep? I'm not going to sleep. I'm up now. <laughs> uh, so you know, yeah. Yep, and that energy that you get inside you when you are playing a gig like that afterwards you don't just step down and go hey i'm gonna go watch wheel of fortune or you know go to yeah. sleep no. uh we played in florida several years ago and i remember this is a <laughs> I, I was kind of going wow really this is happening we played the gig we were all on fire and then we went back to they had run his house to stay in i was up all night in the swimming pool all of a sudden i look at my watch i go it's five in the morning <laughs> you gonna yeah. get some sleep here yeah. 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 Amen. That, that energy can't when it when that hits that can't be turned off. It's not a, it's not a spigot. Yeah. I mean, it, it's got to wear off on its own. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely true. So let's uh, let's kind of talk about a couple of these bands. You uh, mentioned Urban Gypsies, and we've talked yeah. about Aunt Kizzy's Boys, uh, which I dubbed at one point, and I think you'll agree with me, the hardest working band in show business. I believe it was, brother. I mean, not a. I, I mean, man, we. Woo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We we used, to, we used to bring the tools, brother. We we were at the building houses. It was it was it was real. Yeah. All the tools, all the tools from the shed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I think it was Kizzy's that sort of spirited you away from urban gypsies. But talk about yeah. urban gypsies a bit and then a little bit about uh Kizzy's, and then I want to play a song off of uh, Trunk Full of Blues. Oh, right on. Uh, yeah. Well, Urban Gypsies, um, after I'd done that with with um with Tim and those guys. I had met uh, again on a Wednesday night. Uh, like I said, it's the night that we used to, uh, or Boris Carlson used to bring in uh, bands that they would try out for the weekends. Mm -hmm. And uh, I met, uh, uh, if you remember, Samisi. You remember Samisi? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, in Samisi's band at that time was Nate Brown on bass, uh, Monette Marino playing Kungas and Timbales. Sure, yeah. And, my, and, and Michael Mose was uh, coming in and sitting in with people. Yeah, and so right. I said, man, we need, we need to put a band together, you know. And I knew those guys because they would come in on Wednesday nights. And, and so I got talking to Mike, and next thing you know, we, we put this band together. And it was uh, the original band was me, Michael Mose, Charlie George, who, who at that time was still under uh, uh, Epic Records, where he was playing with Virgie Bird at that time. Charlie mm -hmm. George, um, uh, Martin Greaves. Uh, who I think is the, still the head guy over at uh, 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 the Belly Up, but at that time he was playing with Mad Dogs and Englishmen. He had been okay. doing stuff with Joe Cocker on keys. Nice. Uh, James East, the brother of Nathan East, on sure. bass, and uh, Monette. And uh, we decided to put together uh, a funk band, funk soul band, just a cover band. And you know, and and our very first gig was a corporate gig for Coca-Cola. I don't even remember how we got it. But we got a corporate gig, our first gig. And, and and next thing you know, we were just playing all over San Diego. And uh, we were playing, you know, we had our own night. As a matter of fact, they gave us our own night at the belly up. And it's always so, it, it was horrible because we'd open for like <laughs> Parliament. We'd open for Parliament. We, 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 we used to open for Super Diamond there and a bunch mm -hmm. of bands. And uh, they finally gave us our own night. And the night that they gave us, we were all excited. The place was going to be packed because we had been killing it. The night was September 12th. Oh, no. Yeah. So, wow. you know, September 11th, it was the night, the night after. Uh, mm. And we didn't know, no one knew September 11th was going to happen. I mean, we we had, been, mm. we had been given the night two months before. We were setting it up. Sure. It was going to be our first night. Yeah. And uh, But, you know, we did good. Then then we had a chance, our opportunity to go do some world touring. Mm -hmm. And the band, uh, most of the band members in that band were big names and had already a world tour. They didn't want a world tour. They didn't want to. They didn't want to rehearse. We only wrote like two songs, but they were all great mm -hmm. uh, because those guys were just in it for fun. Yeah. And it, here I was, had gotten serious, and you know, I you know, I wanted to do this, and and so Jim Marino, Monette's father, and I don't know if mm -hmm. you knew this, but Jim used to be with the Ink Spots. Oh, okay. Yeah, and so Jim had a meeting with Pam and I, and Jim was like, "Ray, man, you know, you could actually do this stuff, man. You blah 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 blah." 
you know, I, you, 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 you need to move on, you know, the, the, you know, and so again, I quit music. And at that time I had my, my avocado ranch in Fallbrook and, yeah. and Pam as always, Pam has never allowed me to sit on my laurels when it came to music. She's always believed in me. Like I always tell people she believed in me before I believed in myself. So Pam, <laughs> Pam find a jam in uh, Temecula. And I, and I don't remember the name of the club. I, I mean, it's the same club. It's changed names now. And uh, I went to Temecula, sat in this jam, and I met Dwayne. And, it, and, uh, <laughs> and, and the funny thing was, because Dwayne was known for having all this energy and stuff. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so a few people knew a few people who knew I was. You know, they like, you know, I walked in, they're like, hey, that's Sugar Ray, Sugar Ray, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so they brought me right up. I didn't even have to sign up on the list. I thought that was cool. I'm like, oh, man, I got to sign on the list. And so uh, uh, I I, I'm notorious for working drummers into the drum into the ground because I play hard. I play hard and I go hard the entire time. You know, it's not like I'm gonna go hard for a second and you know. So a lot of your, your drummers can hang. So we start this shuffle and and I and I push it up to the tempo of 25 or whatever it was, and, and we rolling and I'm I'm wide open and I look back and Dwayne is right there with me. I'm like, oh okay. And so Dwayne literally told me that after he got done playing with me. He said he he got off the drums. Somebody else set in, and I think I did one more song with somebody. Dwayne went outside and called Jimmy. And oh, then, yeah. uh, um, two weeks later, I came back to the jam, and I called Dwayne. Told him I was going to the jam. I wanted to make sure he was there because I wanted to make yeah, sure he was a good drummer. Yeah, and, yeah. and and Dwayne brought Jimmy. And mm. then uh, two weeks after that, I was playing with Unkissy's Boy at the Idlewild Jazz Festival. I used nice. to have that one brother was playing keyboards at the time with the dress. Yes. I can't remember his name. I'm I'm thinking if it comes to me, I'll I'll bring it up. And, yeah. But but they were tell, talking about you, so they 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 wanted to get rid of that guy. And I guess you had been playing with them off and on or something. I don't know. And I, I've been working with Dwayne for quite a yeah. while at that point. And yeah. so Dwayne yeah. kept talking about you, and so they got rid of that guy. They brought you in, and then uh, that was the band. And then within six months, you know, we was we recorded our first album, and uh, you know, we were rolling, man. It just uh, it it, it just kind of rolled that way. It sure did. Hey, BJ, can we uh, can we play a little bit of "Hey, Pretty Baby"? It's one of my favorite songs we used to do together. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Here we go. Wow, I haven't heard this in a long time. <laughs> Come on, okay. <laughs> it's my 
have Leon Russell roots right there. Yeah, baby. This was up at um, Jimmy's friend. He had that cool studio in his house, remember? Oh, that's right. Now, oh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Sing along with me, baby. Come on, y'all. Here we go. Everybody ready I to sing? Hey. remember the most was I think we had played for seven days in a row before that <laughs> I was hoarse as hell we went in and recorded the album and you know what's so weird is I wind up doing the next seven albums every time we did an album somewhere I was always it was always hoarse it's only been the last three albums that I've gotten to do like oh like what I actually had a week off before I, you know it, 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 we were playing so much I don't know if you know this I was looking at a thing one time we did one time where we played 181 shows that year Wow. Oh my goodness! <laughs> yeah, because you know we had the we we were doing the old chitlin circuit. Remember, we was doing the casinos. Yep. At yep. one point, we was playing with six different casinos, yeah. and a lot of those casinos were like uh, they would book us for a week, or they would book us three days, or you know. Yeah. And then we go up and play Pachanga on a Wednesday night or something. <laughs> it was crazy, and we used to do tour days. Were you ever in the band when we were doing those tour days, Bill? Are you talking about in the Midwest? Well, no, like like even in Kansas, boy, there were times where we would play a show during the. Early in the afternoon, and then we play a, a casino gig or something that night. Oh yeah, yeah, Jeez. yeah, yeah, yeah. I was on was a couple crazy. of those. Yeah, that was crazy, man. <laughs> you know what though? I mean, obviously fun, crazy. You're right, hardest working band in showbiz, and and your voice, as far as being sort of tired a bit when when you're doing the albums, I think that adds to the character, to the color, everybody, the tone. Everybody always say that, but I, yeah. I I always pick out all the horses. I'm like, damn, I was hoarse, <laughs> but you know, it's like. But it was fun. It was yeah. fun. I mean, that's part of being a, a an artist, an entertainer, performer, musician. You're your own worst critic. We all oh, know that. Yeah. Yeah. I hate I hate hearing myself sometimes. I, <laughs> people are like, oh, that sounds great. And I'm like, mm. I, you know, there was, I did a I did a better take on that on the bubble blah, blah, and they didn't use that. Why you put that take in there? You know, you're right, right. right. <laughs> <laughs> so then you struck out on your own now that that takes some that takes some gumption man any any fear when you did that well yeah but you know it wasn't just you know it was more to it than that you know uh this was in the middle of the recession and so P pam and i pam had closed up private practice you know she had the women's health center for many years mm -hmm. there in fallbrook uh and she closed up private practice 
uh, we had to, we wound up having to sell the ranch. You know, it took me three years to build that house. We wound up right. having to get rid of it. And uh, she she had been headhunted from by all these top hospitals and and whatnot. And she decided to take the position over at Cedar Sinai there in Beverly Hills. And so mm -hmm. next thing you know, I'm in L.A. You know, and I, I always tell people, I said, on Kisses, we actually went to France. I wind up having to let the house go. The next day, I was on a flight to France with all my luggage, Pam and I, and, and with me, Pam, and uh, my stepdaughter and some other friends. Anyway, we had an entourage of about 20 people. Uh, <laughs> we went to France for like uh, two weeks or three weeks touring all over France. Mm -hmm. Then we landed at LAX, and I remember looking at Pam um, as we had LAX. We were homeless. We were like, well, what, what are we going to do? It was very weird. You know, uh, it, we, we had money. Uh, but we had nowhere to stay. And we, wow. we I don't know if you know this, but we lived in the Bonaventure for like three months. I did not know that. Yeah, wow. I, lived, I lived in the Bonaventure for three months. Then we wound up getting a place uh, over in, uh, near Koreatown. And I moved all Pam furniture, all her antiques. We moved everything in by myself. You know how you do it. And uh, that night, uh, it was late, so we didn't get a chance to go turn the power on or the, or the gas. So we went back to the Bonaventure. I got back to the Bun Adventure at 11. At midnight, they came knocking on the door <laughs> and uh, woke me up. And it was the fire department. They found me at the Bun Adventure because the place burned down after we put all that furniture in there and it had been oh, in storage man. all the time. Uh -huh. And uh, so, you know, that was the thing. So I was sitting around LA moping. And again, my wife, Pam, <laughs> uh, who never lets me rest on my laurels, laurels she found a jam uh, at this place called Cozy's. And she made me go to the gym. At that time, there was this great uh, blues guy, well-known all over L.A., named John Marks. Mm -hmm. He had been running the gym there for 14 years. And so the first time I went, uh, put my name on the list, they didn't even call me up. But nobody knew. I knew nobody in L.A. except for Chuck Kavoras. And uh, okay. uh, finally, one night, I came back. <laughs> one Monday night, I came back, and uh, uh, they finally brought me up. And I got up there and did my thing, did my spiel. And then two days later, I get a call from the owner of Cozy's. And he was like, listen, man, uh, I saw you playing there the night. You were really good and blah, blah. You know, this jam is legendary. We, we're looking for some new blood to run the jam. And I said, listen, man, I just got to L.A. Uh, you know, everything is clickish. I, I don't want to come in and be be causing the waves. You know, John's yeah. been running that jam for 13 years. He's like, like, no, we've already talked to John. He knows we're starting something new. And uh, next thing you know, I was running the jam at Cozy's. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and, of course, they had not talked to John. <laughs> <laughs> so you know and uh from there um you know I, I think the first three times i did the jam kizzy's drove all the way up from fallbrook and and were, were my my home band wow. and uh and then chuck took over and um chuck of course is just well connected and the next thing you know uh cozy's is the place to be in la uh monday night so we had everybody from the pussycat dolls to my buddies from lifehouse to wow. Uh, Bill Champlin, that's where I met uh, Al Cooper. You know, he wrote, uh, he gave me a whole album of songs to do when I did my first uh, uh, solo album, Blind Alley. I put two of his songs on there. Uh, you know, you name it, uh, the, the barges. Uh, uh, I wound up doing my first commercial because I don't know if you know this. You, you know, I have like my 15 commercials on my belt and stuff yeah, like that. I know that. Yeah. Uh, but uh, wound up doing my first commercial with Stevie Wonder's band. And I can't even remember what the commercial was. But then I, <laughs> from there, Everything just, you know, I became like one of the cats. And then I did uh, songs for uh, tr the movie, True, the show True Blood. I did songs or two episodes of that, uh, a couple songs on uh, Person of Interest. Mm -hmm. I did the theme song for the Judge Joe Brown show. I wound up doing the, uh, uh, for Paramount, I wound up doing this, uh, the trailer. You can still go find it. It's called Island City mm -hmm. with Andy Garcia. And when you hear the trailer, it's me singing the trailer on that. No, no, and no. Uh, then I wound up doing a couple commercials with Jim Bean, uh, mm -hmm. the McDonald's, the ba pa 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 That was me for a long time. And <laughs> so I did, I did, you know, everything just, L.A. just kind of like opened everything up. But then yeah, yeah. I got invited to join this band called the Invitation All-Stars. was my first band in L.A. And, uh. You know, we were playing like some small places like the Liquid Kitty and the Baked Potato, but but you know, but you know, all these movie stars and stuff would show up, and all these big name people. And I used to be like, well, they don't know me. You know what's going on? Because you know, I don't know anybody. But I treat every at that time I didn't know anybody. I didn't know anybody in the business. But I treated everybody the same. That's just me. I'm I'm me. When you meet me, I'm me. And uh, come to find out, the band was Adam Stark, who's now the vice president of Pixar back then there was no such thing with Pixar they were just starting it yeah. uh on the base was Gerald Johnson the real the original bass player from uh 
uh, the Steve Miller band, you know, Space Cowboy and all that, up, yeah. upside down, up at the base. Yeah, yeah. And on the drums, James Gatson. Oh, man. And that wow. was the band, the Invitation yeah. All-Stars. I had no idea who I was playing with. But I wound <laughs> up getting to play with Emerson Lake and Palmer, with Richard Sambora, Luca Third. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, Mick Finnegan, Mike Finnegan, all them guys. I, you know, it was just it just became the thing, and I became part of the scene, you know. And uh, yeah. and uh, and then from there, one night sitting in with me, Jimmy Vivino, Cal David, uh, and uh, Nate Watts, and I forget who was on the drum who at, at this little place in Tarzana, and that's where I met Randy Sharkoff, and uh, he asked me. Two days later, if I would join the Managed Boys, I had never heard the Managed Boys. I, I was like, whatever, yeah, cool. And two days, two days after that, I was in Honduras, Spain, uh, oh, in front man. of ninety thousand people with a band I had never met, and that's that, that's how it all goes. <laughs> that's the Bible of the music business, yeah. right there, Sugar Ray. I hope you are writing a book. No, because, I, I'm too young uh, to be writing a book. <laughs> well, you know, you start now. You, <laughs> you start now. Work on it for 20 years. One day, I've been, I, as I said, I've been really blessed. I've been very lucky and, and, and blessed. Now, luck is realizing opportunity and being prepared for it. Mm -hmm. but, but, but I have been very lucky. Yeah, yeah. Luck has a lot to do with it, but also, you know, you bring an attitude and a personality that has, I think, an equal amount to do with it. You know, uh, if you walk in and, and you're full of yourself and and oh you're god, the new no. kid on the block, you know. No, I, I you know, I, I again, I treat everyone I meet, yeah. uh, with the yeah. same respect as right. you know. I don't, I don't care if you, uh, you know, uh, I guess a slash had got mad at me because he had come to the jam a couple of nights and mm -hmm. I didn't know who he was. I met him one time before in New Orleans. He had. I was sitting in at the place called the Crazy Corner, and he jumped in and blew up the guy's amp, and then ran out. Uh, but I never, <laughs> he had never got to meet him. So mm -hmm. uh, he had come a couple nights, and uh, 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 I didn't call him up. And so mm -hmm. I, that's when I told Chuck, I said, Chuck, you know, I don't know these guys. I've heard their music, but you know, I come out of the gospel world, and then I quit music for eighteen years. I don't. Yeah. I've been, I've been basically doing cover stuff, and then Unkizzy's Boys. I mm -hmm. don't know any of these guys. I said, you know these guys. So when they come in. You know, you need to let me know who they are. And so finally, Slash got them played, and that was cool. I remember the night he came back with Jim Carrey. And so Jim Carrey wanted to sing, and I was like, that's fine, man. I said, but, you know, I have a rule. Again, I, you know, I've been to the movies. I knew who Jim Carrey was. I knew who yeah, he was. Sure. But I was like, I, we, we have a rule here. You can play whatever you want. So whatever you play, it would be the blues. And that was my <laughs> rule. Everybody came in there. I don't care how big a rock star or hip-hop guy. You know, I used to get uh, Tommy Davis and those guys, uh, uh, Bobby Brown, Raphael Sadiq, Faison, all those guys used to be there. Mm -hmm. And uh, but if you want to come on the mic, it's got to be blues. And so one mm -hmm. night, uh, he brought in uh, it was uh, uh, like I said, Slash and uh, and Jim Carrey, and they did a, a rounding re rendition of "Old Black Betty," and I was shocked, mm -hmm. you know, because Jim Carrey could actually sing. He was throwing down "Old oh, Black Betty," "Bam Lam," yeah. "Black Baby," and "Girl." Bam. I was like, yeah. wow, you know, and and so uh, it all just kind of happened for me from from there. Yeah, right on. You know, I'm glad you said uh, Chuck Kavoris' name because that's the studio where we recorded uh, Trunk Full of Blues. So thanks. For yeah, that's what it was, Chuck's. It was Chuck's. Turning oh, that light on he, for me. He's probably going to send me a, light, a, a letter in a minute. Like, he's probably watching this like, you dirty mother. I can't believe it. Like, hey, Chuck, I can't remember everything. <laughs> no kidding. You know what, though? One thing I really remember is that you were nominated for a gra uh, Grammy uh, and then you won a BMA award. We're going to show a little, uh, several. Okay. Well, there you are. <laughs> oh, there they are behind oh, you. Oh, yeah. Right on. Okay. Yeah, but I wanted to cover it. It took me a long time. I've been nominated for for six or seven years, the BB mm -hmm. King Entertainer of the Year. And mm -hmm. I finally won that. The year before, I had won the Soul Blues Male Artist. But last year, I won the BB King Entertainer of the Year and uh, Best Male Blues Soul Artist. So I won both. So I have three now. Yeah. And I'm nominated again this year. Uh, which is kind of weird, but uh, uh, but it's uh, I've been blessed, I've been real lucky, and a bunch yeah. of other different awards. And that's my Grammy medallion hanging up there in the shadow box. There uh, you go. So that was really cool for somebody to save me, Eric Corn, 40 Below Records. Thank oh, you, yeah. appreciate yeah. that. Wow, yeah, that's awesome, good man. Uh, and I know you've done a lot of albums, uh, yeah. and you know, if if we had the time, I'd love to just play those albums straight through, but we're gonna play <laughs> one more song. 
uh, Ray, before we uh, before we wrap today, and I mean this is this has been great. Uh, hey, well, I got time. It's up to you, brother. I got nothing to do. <laughs> I, I've been up since seven o'clock, seven thirty this morning. We got my hike in. I'm feeling good. So. <laughs> right on. Uh, but the song that uh, that we're going to play actually is the title song off of "Somebody Save Me," and I think it's really pertinent going back to the conversation we had a little bit ago about the gentleman in Santee. Yeah. Uh, your music saved him, obviously. And I've read some of the comments uh, on the YouTube video of Somebody Save Me. And people have said, this song touched me right in the heart and, and saved me. So I need to go look at that. I haven't, you know, I never, <laughs> I, I'm bad with that stuff. Man. I, <laughs> you know, I, I, let me give a shout out to my, my management, really, if you don't mind. I know we got to go for the minute. I want to, I want to give a shout out to Stephanie Gonzalez, Apropos Management. Uh, I'm very lucky to get her. She manages me and George Benson. Those are her. And now Sullivan Quinn, us three. Uh, shout out to my record company again, uh, Eric Corn Forty Below Records. Uh, a big shout out to my uh, media company, Magicians Media, uh, Bunny Burke and Tristan DeVito, those guys. And uh, the, my uh, producer who worked with me all the time on my show, The Sugar Shack, uh, Eric Sassaman. And mm -hmm. uh, so I wanted to just say, into my own band, those, those guys who would back me up. And I, I have, you know, we we were looking at it. I've done seventy three percent of the world. I have drugged these guys all <laughs> over the planet, and uh, and they still kind of like me, so that's pretty cool. Yeah, <laughs> uh, Ray, if you have links to Sugar Shack and any other links you want uh, to send me, uh, you can send them directly, or have uh, have Bonnie email them to me, and uh, BJ will post them on your listing. Ho ho hopefully, Bunny is on here listening. So, Bunny, if you are, <laughs> uh, but you know the the, e the easy way is to go to my website at yeah. www.sugarrayrayford.com. I think Eric okay. has a link on there for the YouTube. Okay. Uh, it goes live every Tuesday uh, uh, to Facebook and YouTube, and we do it mm -hmm. noon to one Pacific Standard Time. So. Okay. And my guest this week will be uh, my main man, Kirk Eli Fletcher, coming all the way from Switzerland. So check it out. That's cool. Uh, yeah, right That's on. Cool. Well, we're gonna we're gonna roll somebody save me, and hang on, you know, we can chat a little bit afterwards. But uh, okay. man, Ray, this is great. Uh, it's it's good to so see you, Bill. It is really to good you. to see you, man. <laughs> Right back at you, man. I didn't know what happened to you. I hadn't seen you around. It's kind of funny because I don't see anybody. You know, I'm traveling. I don't. I, I expect to see Dwayne or Joe or somebody mm -hmm. out. And uh, every once in a while, for a few years back, I was seeing Joe. But I know we got to go. I, I get along with it. I, oh, I, no, I really that's, that's no, all right. And, and, and our audience today, too. I mean, I, there's uh, some some people that we are familiar with. Uh, Diggy Cat, who does a, a live radio program. And then a name that popped up, too, which like uh, I hadn't seen forever, which was uh, Phil Piper, the drummer. And he said, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, wow, Phil. Well, awesome. Good to see you. But he's like, <laughs> you remember seeing it? He's on your drum kit with the gyp er, gypsies rocking at uh, the Boar's Cross. And I'm like, that's, I mean, it takes me back. All these stories take me back. But then just hearing like how L.A. is just you've crushed it you've crushed la man yeah, so well, and you know and that's really weird because la is one of them places i always tell people if you're a musician don't go to la i'm and terrified like, of well, it i'm terrified of LA. Like, well people ask you like well why i say because whatever the industry you play in uh if you take the top 10 guys in the world eight of them live in la and, <laughs> and not only not only do they live in la uh they've been there for a long time and so they own first calls so mm. it's almost impossible to yeah. get into the scene i was just right. lucky I was lucky, and with the help of Chuck, you know, uh, I didn't try to force my way into the scene. Anything, it, it just kind of, I just kind of slid in, and it, it was one of the things where I was into the scene, didn't even realize I was in the scene, wasn't looking to get in the scene, you know. But I just got lucky. Well, I, I think it's based on the quality of your character and your your immense talent, and just you know, yep. who can deny that, man? They're just <laughs> making it happen. You make it happen. You yep. you did, uh -huh. you know. I would, I would probably, I would freak out. <laughs> I, 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 again, I'd say it's luck, man, because there's a lot of people mm -hmm. out there who are uh, much better singers than I am, much better writers than I am. I, the only thing I ever boast about is you may be a better singer, you may be a better writer, uh, but I'm going to entertain the living hell out of you. Mm -hmm. and, yes. uh, so that, that's, that's my strength, and that's what I uh, work for. Amen. Awesome. And, you know, you said you weren't looking for it. You weren't looking to make no. it happen. That had a lot to do with it, too, right? Well, I didn't know yeah. anything about it, Bill. I guess so. <laughs> you know, like I said, I, I mean, every band I played with was world-class guys when I got to L.A., and I didn't know who they were. So, yeah. But, again, it goes back to what I keep saying is I treat everyone with the same level of respect. Mm -hmm. And, right. uh, yeah. uh, you know, I, I respect everyone unless they don't respect me, you know, and I, yeah. then I don't care who you are. Yeah. But uh, but I, I – I've been blessed. I've been really lucky, and I've been blessed, and I and I know that, and I and I appreciate it.
And you keep thinking that way. We're going to, uh, we're going to roll somebody save me. One more thing I want to just throw out here because your, your comment about all the guitar players, uh, most of the, you know, the best being in in LA guitar player I worked with uh, out in the Inland Empire, uh, for a while said one night, well, you know, if you shake a, uh, shake a tree in California, five guitar players fall out. (laughs) It's true. (laughs) <laughs> I think I think Clapton even said something like that, and his uh, team made it redacted. You know, because uh, you know he was saying something about how you know they were talk- calling him the go- God, and I think he said something like, "Yeah, yeah I'm all right." He said, I know some guys in L.A. that will play circles around me, and but they made him re- redact that. You know, because that's really like I understand now. You know, there's a lot of business around me now. You know, yeah, it, it yeah, used to just right. be me. And there's a lot more involved, so I have to kind of you know. That's the game, though. <laughs> <laughs> it sure is. You're in it. You're playing it. You learn the rules. Yeah. You play by them. Hey, Ray, this has been so much fun. Uh, again, thank you. And best thank you to both. Pam. Absolutely. Best to Pam. Uh, and just continued success. Hey, I, I want, uh, before you go, he always try to run out. He's always this way. I love guys like this. <laughs> you know, y'all that don't know, I know Bill is doing this now. And he was with uh, Uncasey's Up Boys and all that stuff. But Bill was also the one that was instrumental at getting Jewel, if you guys remember Jewel. Yeah. He was very instrumental in getting Jewel started and playing and all that. Matter of fact, he he was like put together, I think, a first album, or help her with a first album and all that. Mm-hmm. If, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, I remember that, Bill. So, mm-hmm. you know, you, you know, this is a real cat, y'all. This is a real cat. <laughs> Jewel, and then who was, who was her companion? Steve? Was it Steve? I don't remember. Don't, don't remember. Uh, gosh, I mean, he's, I he's like the most charismatic one of the most charismatic San Diego artists. And like his name is just flying away from my brain. And I picture, I can see him. I can see him in my face. You know, back, back then there was a, you know, San Diego. I don't, I don't know how it is now. Uh, but back then there were so many great artists and San Diego was always a really weird scene, but it, it, it there were so many great artists and great bands back, back yeah. in the day. And I remember yeah. it used to be like 25, 30 venues, you know, yeah, you, you had brick by brick, you had the bear football, you had uh Humphreys backstage. You had the Humphreys. Yeah. I mean, they used to be, and so any any Friday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday night, you can go out and see five bands in San Diego. I, I don't think it's that way now, which is sad, but it definitely used to be. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's it's starting to come back. My uh, my my oldest son, Ryan, uh, and his fiance Cassie, they have a band called the Cassie B Project, and they're playing Tin Roof quite a bit. Obviously, okay. it all it all stopped, but it's starting yeah. to pick back up again. There's a couple of clubs, one in PB and one in downtown. Uh, and anyway, they're they're busy rocking it. So we used to play that place in PB. Uh, it was back then. It was called the Longboard, and then uh, there was the one that's right there at the very end of the road at PB, right on the beach. I can't remember mm-hmm. the name of Matt, uh, but I remember going there one night seeing Magic Slim. Was it Magic Slim? Magic Slim was an older blues gentleman, and uh, we wound up playing there years later with uh uh uh, uh, uh Warren Weeby mm-hmm. and. Uh, there was another great guy. He always reminded me of Charles Bradley, and I can't think of his name that escaped me. This San Diego, but San Diego used to have some unbelievable uh, musicians. You know, yeah. I mean, it's crazy. I mean, even Leo, who was with my band, you know, he had played sax- he played keyboards with us, but he had played saxophone for all them years with uh, Ike Turner and uh, and it worked all those years with Re- Robbie Shankar and Nora uh, Jones. Yeah. you know, the right, other right. for yeah. years. So, yeah. Yeah, as a matter of fact, Ravi uh, was a friend of the museum. Uh, BJ, I think he did one of our gala events yeah, one night. I had the the great privilege of accepting a, a instrument donation for the presentation. So I was standing right there behind him, like, "Is this really happening right now?" <laughs> Receiving an instrument from Ravi Shankar, and so we were lucky to 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 count him as an advocate for the museum uh, yeah. before he passed. So, mm-hmm. oh, that's pretty yeah. cool. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah. Yeah, well, now you got me going, Ray. I'm not going to stop. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> no, what I want, what what I want to say is, a, you need to get down to Carlsbad and come see the museum, and b, we need to get Sugar Ray Rayford to do one of our concerts someday, somehow. So somehow, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm down, man. I'm, I'm going to throw that out to the universe. I'm going to leave it at that, and uh, bless you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Oh man, so much fun. PJ, why don't and we I, go ahead and, and roll? Yeah, it? And I, I want and, and, and I want my NAM tickets. <laughs> you guys hook a brother up make sure you remind me and we'll get you we'll get you there all right <laughs> hear 
was a struggle in my mind It's a real tug of war Back and forth the pendulum swings And I'm so dizzy I'm down on the floor Somebody save me I can't make it on my own Somebody save me And I'm on a dangerous road Somebody save me I'm running, I'm running out of hope mm -hmm. There's a thorn in my side A nagging pain that won't end There's a hole deep in my heart And it's opening wide Once again Somebody save me I can't make it on my own Somebody save me And oh see i want to thank you guys thank you sugar ray thank you mr bill uh this is probably the most fun uh interview we've had in a long <laughs> time and just amazing career amazing um just the truth man what what, what your, how your career is and just I, I, i've taken i've taken some of a lot of it to heart um what you've been what you've been saying so i uh, appreciate that i appreciate you um I'm going to take us out uh, and let's see what's coming up on the horizon. Again, uh, for more information about uh, Sugar Ray Rayford, www.sugarrayrayford.com. Sugar Ray Rayford. Sugar Ray Rayford. Sugar Ray with one R. S U G A R A Y. R A Y F O R D. The Sugar Shack is every Tuesday, 12. Nope. 
12 to 1, noon to 1 Pacific Standard Time. All right. So if you enjoyed today, uh, go check this out every Tuesday. Um, <laughs> go, go visit the Sugar Shack. That's yeah, awesome. I thought we were coming up on our 71st show. I thought it was 60 something. Oh, like, no, it's wow. like 70, 70 something shows. So. It's, yeah. It flies by when you're having fun, you know. It's just <laughs> yeah, it's been, it's been a lot of fun. It actually is, yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, let's see what we've got on the horizon for Mom at Home uh, Monday. Uh, so we, we're going to take the weekend off. We're going to take a couple days off and then come back right at uh, Monday, May 3rd at 2 p.m. And we're going to welcome Michael Franklin pianist, composer, arranger, and has done so much work, including work with John Anderson. We're going to explore uh, his career and talk about what he's uh, been up to. Uh, another friend of Bill who we've met through uh, just just kindness and the network and all these wonderful people that we know. And then following that, uh, we're not going to have a mom at home next Friday because we're doing the mom at home on Monday. Uh, but the Friday following on Friday, May 14th, we welcome Sylvia Tyson, a folk music, Canadian folk music award winner. Uh, she's gonna be talking about her career and her work in the Canadian music scene. Uh, so join us for that. Uh, we're going to learn a lot about, uh, our, our neighbors up north until then uh everyone thank you for joining us thank you wonderful wonderful live audience today just so many i mean i've got a lot of comments of people that have have, have seen sugar ray live or just love his music and um sorry we weren't able to address any of the questions because the conversation was just so awesome uh and it's good to see some uh, old friends there and, and new friends so we appreciate you joining us for this uh until next time though uh we are going to be opening up the museum of making music after our massive massive site-wide renovation uh, opening back up to the public on june 15th visit our website for more information about that museum of making music.org as well as uh what's coming up on our calendar you can see uh future episodes of mom at home there and what we have on the horizon until then everyone take care and have a wonderful safe weekend we hope to see you back on monday